Welcome to Present Poetry, a reading podcast with your host, Erin Crittenden. All poems used in this podcast are either public domain or used with permission from the author or the estate. So sit back, relax, and get ready to hear some poetry from the past and the present. This week's featured poet is Colin Pope. Colin Pope grew up in the Adirondack Mountains of New York and has had his poetry, essays, and criticisms published in journals such as Slate, Best New Poets, Los Angeles Review, Rattle, Willow Springs, and Denver Quarterly. His manuscript, Prayer Book for an American God, was named a finalist for the 2018 Louis Bogan Award and he is also the recipient of two Academy American Poet Prizes, as well as various residents and scholarships from the Vermont Studio Center, Gemini Inc., the New York State Summer Writers Institute, Round Top Poetry Festival, and others. Colin holds a MFA from Texas State University and is currently a PhD candidate at Oklahoma State University in Stillwater, where he works on the editorial staffs of both the Cimarron Review and the Nimrod International. We are reading poems from his book, Why I Didn't Go to Your Funeral, which came out in 2019. It is a poetic journey that follows the suicide of a loved one and explores what it really means to be left behind. This poem is titled, Bliss. We laid down to pull, one by one, the strings in each other's bodies. I raised your legs, poured nakedness out the wheelbarrow of your jeans, then ran a palm across your thigh's brown acreage, and you explained, I used to do it to wake myself up. Toe lines of thick blades were imprinted, shining in your flesh, almost like an animal had wandered underneath and was clawing at the bark of your skin from the inside. Why, I whispered, kissing the firm, upturned lip of each and every scar. If all you ever did was breathe, and every breath was a moan, like the one you let escape as I moved inward, I never would have sought an answer. We could still be in bed this minute, growing so large we could touch every corner of each other at once. But you wanted more, or you knew that this was it, or you told me, because something is inside that steals from the garden of your consciousness and must be excavated and destroyed. I reached in and plucked the heavy fruits that came free with a sigh. I tugged at the silver stems of the small infinity we tended, but I could never understand. Just don't do it again, I said. You smiled because you couldn't promise, because at that moment the razor was so sharp it trimmed me away from you who I could never be, who had mined a sunlight so permanent and terrible it would be hard to swear, merely for love, that you'd never dig for it again. This poem is called Elegy for the Drive-In. I used to like how the heads were so big they were the size of Buick's, and how the picture jumped on breezy nights like a hand fleeing under a blanket, and how the tension of the part where the two young rebels decided to play chicken reached inside and made you, for a moment, actually believe in youth. How you could feel everyone else believing and reaching there towards the blank history that didn't give a damn and was growing farther and farther away, like a flat stone skipping towards the bottom of a pond. And knowing that inside the little boxes of cars were thrumming hearts that pounded like naked fists on midnight doors and driving quietly into the distance, after how your smallness came back into you, how you were warm with possession from this that you could never hold, and the smell of exhaust in your hands, wild and sad as it dispersed, like the emptiness the waterhole feels when the animals leave it for the sun, and I miss knowing that it was there for my nights, and then knowing it was there for everyone who so wantonly jailed inside their cars, 
watch the world with so many new kinds of love. This poem is called The Necessary. This is the moment when the 90-year-old turns in her white, white bed and asks me what it's like to have an orgasm. And since she's never had one, and since the top floor of the hospice is completely deserted this time of night, and since what question could really be off limits at this point, I describe out loud different things she should imagine. Riding a motorcycle, sprinting the orchard with a shirt full of stolen apples, Standing up from the hot soil in the garden when a breeze licks the sweat off your back. Oh, is that what it's like? she asks. I guess not, I say. The droplets glitter from the bag spike to the drip chamber and into her veins, threading the clear outside with the inner. To be honest, I've never understood more than I've witnessed. The arch of a spine, or the tilt of hips, or the reactive moans that seem to issue from the pure, dumb luck of my touch. It hurts for real, down to your core, when you realize the cables and fiber optics are an invention, that the telepathies of pleasure linking your senses with someone else's were only a myth of your ego, which you hoped you'd never see so exposed to open air. She's grimacing a little, and I want to give her this. I want to tell her it looks kind of like losing something inside yourself, searching for it, but even that sounds stupid to me, like a cruel ambiguity, like she should just lie down and shut her eyes and seek out the seams between one consciousness and another, that easy. And I'd like to admit that I'm jealous of her, for once in my life I'd like to confess how much worse I am for the pursuit of sex, overwhelmed by some Darwinian curse like a male spider without a head. But it's late. The janitor's cart chirps up the hall, and I'll never feel so clean. Relax, I tell her. Close your eyes and breathe deep, and let's just see what we can do for that pain. This poem is called, If You Ever Become a Paper Doll. After surviving the fanfold and admiring your oblique body, don't be surprised when a chain of perfect strangers unfurl themselves from the raw material of you and hold your hand. It's normal to be anxious, but if you're as good as you say you are, you won't worry about who created whom in whose image or begrudge the loss of touch. Or which one of you is the mother, the father, which came first? Pray when the crayon touches your face that the god of expression blesses you with a smile. Remember the two small dots for the eyes. Pray for shirt, for hair. Be thankful you're not that poor lonely twin at the end of the line, one arm raised and reaching out for someone who will never reach back. This poem is called, Why I Didn't Go to Your Funeral. Of course you didn't know what you'd made of me. A blubbering focus, the frantic epicenter around which soft hands gathered to instruct and caress. For three weeks I moaned and jerked like a carnival ride, owing visits, wading an amaranthine stream of sorry, sorry, sorry. Then I cleaned your house, took your dog, proposed quiet solutions to the immobile planet of your mother's head. When she said, I just can't, would you go to the funeral parlor and take care of things? I acquiesced, her voice a burned lampshade. Leaving the drive, the tire scratched and turned, and I couldn't tell who was being cared for anymore. I didn't know if I cared. I witnessed the white taken hold blanketing you silent on the gurney as the water left my eyes uncontrolled, a fact of pouring. You weren't autonomic, and then professional hands slid you into flames to complete the notion that you couldn't exist. Oh, your friends came to the house, stood in a clump beneath the railing from which you dangled your noose. Daisies, I think, 
tied with a string, and a picture that kept blowing over, and nervous shoes in the dust. It was ritual enough since you didn't exist, and the apologies had been stoppered up as though there weren't enough left. They were hoarding them now, the sounds and letters having returned to simple shapes like a face stared upon intently for too long. On the patio of a treehouse, a man said he hated you, and I tried to get mad, but he meant it, and I didn't, and we hugged until my apathy returned again, warm and cool and gray as a corpse. Fuck her, he said. God damn her. Nod, I said. Look away and nod, then walk to the car. You know, I didn't even send flowers to your service. Not a note or a card. I pillowed myself to the shape of a day and waited for a head which never came. Nothing came. I would have gone to say goodbye, but I was all that was left. I drank instead. Thank you for listening to this episode of Present Poetry. If you enjoyed it, please leave us a review, share us on social media, or subscribe so you never miss an episode. If you would like to learn more about the featured poet, or you would like your work featured on the podcast, please check out the links in the show notes. Thank you again for listening, and I hope you all have a wonderful day. Bye-bye.